Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to day three of Operation Defend the North. We will now be beginning module 4C, where we'll be diving into the impact on travel, tourism, and hospitality. I'm joined by my co-hosts, Jack Brooks and Mark Dillon. You've been hearing from them across the last two days. Mark, if I can turn it to you to provide some urgent updates on what information do we have right now about the attack on Northern Horizons. So at the beginning of uh, day three, we're getting information from uh, Horizons that the outage, which is affecting approximately 70% of uh, Ontario, people without power, is caused by a what they believe to be a successful supply chain attack, which means something was, as, as they received equipment, Somewhere along the line, something malicious was placed in there, um, and they believe it was intentional. And essentially, it's affecting their grid automation, so their physical uh, OT equipment that automates what would have historically been done manually. This is, would be inside of the SCADA system, um, and it's the physical side of the SCADA system. And, and it was malfunctioning in a way that was posing a risk to public safety. And so they believe that they have isolated the cause um, and their next steps are to share more information with their partners, as well as start to isolate the breach so that they can come up with a timeline for restoration, which they don't have yet. Mark, if I can uh, keep you on the spot here, the nature of what you're hearing right now, from your perspective, and especially we have a lot of folks at the table who may not necessarily, and those who are watching online, who may not necessarily understand mm -hmm. the specifics at play over here. We have a lot of executives as well that have to make decisions but may not know the specifics or understand the technicalities. If I can put it in very simple terms, how easy would it have been for this attack to have been executed? What controls had to have been missing? So it, it would take, uh, you'd have to have access to the supply chain. You'd have to be part of that process where, you know, think if you think of a, of a laptop, right, by the time it gets to you, it's been at, you know, 15, 20 different places. You know, HP doesn't make the processor, right? They, somebody else does. And each step as you get closer to the finished product, the final thing is assembled eventually. And in every single set of hands that has access to making that finished product along the way has a potential access to do something to it that could provide them backdoor access or provide some sort of controllable feature that could be activated years down the road. Most of this equipment is ordered um, not, not even annually. It, it takes years to assemble automated uh, grid or automated generation tools. And so it's possible that this was done two, three years ago or that it's just something new that showed up last month. Okay. Mark, uh, I'll come back to this conversation and now there, there was uh, something that's come up in this discussion as well around bill of materials as well. So I'll, I'll come mm -hmm. back to you a little bit later on. There, there are two sort of discussions that we will be having right now as, as we move this along. The technicalities in terms of the response and the tooling that's needed, but at the same time, there is an impact to this specific industry or industries, travel, tourism, and hospitality. And Jack, you, you take an insurance lens, but also a cyber lens into things. Can you help us understand that from your perspective, what are at least two major impacts that you think have hit both travel, tourism, and hospitality? Yeah, I think... <clears throat> There's, I mean, there's obviously many, but I guess uh, the two that that sort of leap to mind for me is, you know, when we talk about travel in general and the communications, we talked on day one, I believe, around we want to keep people off the roads, what have you. Obviously, there's some travel, some moving around that has to take place. And how do we communicate what is legitimate travel, what's not? Um And then when we think about tourism and hospitality, um, you know, the especially when you think about a city like Toronto, uh, but many cities in the province have a lot of visitors, depending on what time of year, especially, um, you know, perhaps in some rural areas. And there's a lot of very unique um, needs, uh, maybe some communication issues, people who English or French isn't their first languages. How do we serve them? Right? It's not like they've got a support system in the province. Uh, they're going to feel especially isolated. So I'm really looking forward to that conversation as well. Thank you, Jack. And uh, I am aware that we do have a short 
news video that will be coming up uh, in, in a couple of seconds. But before that, I do want to add that, you know, along with all of this, one of the sessions we'll be going into is the cross-border impact. And we're not just talking the United States exclusively, but yeah. other areas as well. And I, I also do feel, and, and looking at some of the concerns that have been raised by our online audience as well, given that right now we've been speaking about this from the perspective of this is impacting Canadians and Canadian citizens and residents. There are other folks that are within our borders as well, and any other legislation and compliances that can kick in and reportings that may have to kick in might be very, very important. So I, I look forward to, to diving deep into this. Uh, I'm just going to get ready to, uh, to show you a quick news update that we have received with regards to the impact on, uh, on this sector that will be coming up on your screens very, very shortly. Good evening, and welcome to our special coverage on the nationwide blackout triggered by a cyber breach. The blackout has sent shockwaves through travel, tourism, and hospitality industries. Airports are in disarray with flights grounded and travelers stranded. Train services are disrupted, causing inconvenience for commuters. Big event venues stand silent, and restaurants struggle with power outages affecting their operations. This blackout isn't just about dark streets. It's about disrupted plans, lost reservations, and financial hits to businesses. As authorities work to restore power and services, the impact on travelers and businesses continues to unfold. So there's a huge financial impact to all of this. And, and as we were discussing, that uh, economic impact uh, generator, as it's, as it's building over a period of time, I, I believe it's going to get to that number where, where we think it needs to be at by the end of this day. Now, there, I, I want to bring you into the conversation, and, and I want to be very transparent when I ask these questions. And they may turn out to be a little bit too direct, but it's a question that executives right now want to hear, and the people probably want to hear as well. From your perspective in Team Armis, you were consistently pushing on us asset intelligence, understanding your assets. And then Mark has just given us a little bit of more perspective is that even a single piece of equipment, bare metal, whatever it may be, touches multiple other hands. Not everything gets assembled in one particular place. There's shipping involved, so on and so forth. When we're talking asset intelligence, are you suggesting that we need to have a level of insight into these assets that go as far back as what did this asset look like at ground zero? What else, what kind of intelligence do we need to have at this point to know what vulnerabilities may sit within our asset stack alone? Um, great question. And uh, what you're describing sounds daunting, but the reality of uh, how uh, attack surfaces look these days is that they are more complex and, uh, and bigger than they've ever been before. And they're rising exponentially. Supply chain attacks uh, are something that we're seeing more and more of uh, because they work. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you're as strong as your weakest link and there are a lot of links in that chain. So there's a lot of incentive to compromise uh, third parties along the way. Uh, it's not something that uh, we need to think of as uh, science fiction. This is happening absolutely in a multitude of different attacks and this is a very real scenario to contend with. Uh, I think that uh, when it comes to the ability of an organization to map these things out, uh, there's actually quite a bit uh, that can be done. I think that uh, HBOM and SBOM are a step, a first step. Uh, they're not the end all be all, but they're definitely a very important step because you can at the very least derive from that uh, vulnerabilities and risks that can exist in the equipment that you have. Uh, I think third party risk uh, metrics that rely on actual data of what you have is another crucial step. And lastly, I would say that uh, uh, intelligence as it relates to uh, threat actors, things that are actually happening and how they tie back into what are the current targets um, around the world? What's uh, the equipment? What's the focus? Things like that all come together in really quantifying and understanding an attack surface. But to your question, uh, third parties, supply chains, things like that are absolutely part of that mix. It can't be just your stuff or the end result of your own network or environment. 
Okay, and and to the folks here, I'm going to advise you at any point of time, please feel free to to chime in and and counter what has been shared as well, because I, I'm I'm list listening at listening to a lot of other responses that are coming in as well. George, uh, I'm I'm going to loop you into the conversation, and 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 again, I'm I'm going to ask very very directly. We've seen over a period of time that both from a federal, predominantly from a federal level, we do get alerts to discontinue certain pieces of equipment from certain vendors. In the last two months, we've heard about certain companies being told to seize operations as well. Do you believe that in this situation, there may have been a miss where a certain vendor, a certain product, we may have not received adequate intelligence or alerts about? And should we be looking at our federal counterparts to say, if this is well and truly a supply chain attack, the way in which Nader had just articulated, that they've dropped the ball in some shape or fashion? Again, no, we're we're uh, theorizing because we still have not gone to the root cause of the incident. So we still don't know if it is something that was a component within the supply chain. That said, um, third party risk, uh, I'd say, especially in the last couple of years with, with cloud integrated technologies, it has become probably the single biggest threat vector in terms of growth. Uh, in the entire, uh, I'd say, in the entire connected uh, world of internet things, um, we should really look upon how we conduct our third-party uh, risk management as part of the public sector procurement process when we're talking about utilities. I mean, when we look at procurements, we're looking at a lot of capabilities and we're looking at business case evaluations, and oftentimes it, it comes down to, if we're being honest, lowest common winner gets or lowest common lowest common bidder gets the win. Right. Oftentimes, because we cut those corners, we do not have the scrutiny necessary to conduct detailed deep dives into the actual physical components or how those components are built and assembled. We also don't know at this point, because we have globally integrated supply chains, if every component was actually sourced in Canada which becomes even even harder of a challenge to, to, to look at because now you're getting opponents imported in. They might be from third party countries that are not under the same type of regimen for, for, uh, for compliance. So if they're not a five eyes country, but you have to order parts from there or you're ordering chips from Taiwan, right? For example, Taiwan produces, I think 80% of the world's microchips, right? We don't know what happens between when they're being produced in Taiwan to when they get here. That presents a massive point of risk for us. I think a lot more investment in time and resource has to go into third-party risk assessments and deep dive assessments in physical, in physical technologies before they're actually procured. And to speak to Mark's point, these things take years sometimes to assemble. We have the time to do it. It should be done on a per component basis, depending on the architecture, depending on the plan. I know it's, it's a very deep dive question. I wish I had a more simple answer, but it, it's it's a huge answer in terms of how you actually structure your architecture, how you actually do your component build, and then how you break things down in your risk management on a per component basis, depending on source of that component. Thank you, George. I know Mark has, uh, Michael, sorry, has something to add, but Michael, before we go to you and I'll queue up the AV team as well, Mark, uh, I believe you wanted to respond to George. Well, I was just thinking, we were talking yesterday about how unlikely it is that we're even keeping up with patching the things we know about. And I, I agree with everything you said. Uh, this is a whole new set of diligence that I don't think most entities are doing right now. And I wonder if addressing it at the local company level is the right place or if there's some other supply chain management program that could be brought in. And, and it wouldn't just be hardware, right? We've seen uh, recent supply chain attacks inside of software when you get a tool, which a system that includes software from a vendor, often they'll grab a bunch of libraries and as they're cobbling together the system that they're going to sell you, code they didn't write, code that is often publicly maintained, that we've seen purposeful, malicious, recent attacks where someone's put in a backdoor that has caused problems. Even going all the way back to Heartbleed, there was speculation that that, that was done intentionally. Mark, thank you for that. Uh, I know that we have Michael from Team Armist that uh, that would like to chime in. Michael, I will unmute and allow you to continue. Michael, please jump in. Yes, I, I definitely want to add to what everybody is saying is correct. Um, it is very hard to uh, touch upon the supply chain as it, the technology is getting built. But one process I've actually instituted a lot, George, 
organizations, both in the healthcare space, medical space, as well as aer aerospace, is to test the systems before they go into production. Look for these type of systems that will be showing uh, indications that they're not performing the way they're supposed to perform. Has actually identified numerous types of te technologies in the past we've uh, actually identified has been backdoored. Doing this process before they go into production has been a lifesaver quite a bit. Thank you for that, uh, Ruzbe. Just before you and Michael, I really appreciate that perspective and, and thank you for chiming in. Rachel, I'll go to you and then to Ruzbe. Rachel? Yeah, so I just wanted to follow up on um, these points that are being made about should businesses be the ones who are responsible for assessing their own third-party risk? Um, I agree that there's a component that, that belongs in the business, but going back to Mark's earlier example with a laptop, um, perhaps your vendor is the supplier of that laptop and that's your third party, but that laptop then has their third party vendors, right? And if we get to the point where as a business, uh, we are going after every physical piece of technology um, that touches our systems, there's no business because it's, it's rabbit holes that you'll endlessly be going down. So to me, this is something where I wonder if, if there could be um, almost like regulation or, um, you know, as something is kind of entering the country um, at that point, would that third, fourth party, fifth party even um, investigative work take place? Because I, I really don't think it's realistic to expect that a business will go beyond their third parties um, to do a deep dive or an investigative uh, assessment. And then additionally, I think there are so many different, you know, third parties and, and components here that um, there's a need to tier by risk. And maybe that risk is, you know, the, the country it's coming from, intelligence and indicators that we're getting, um, the type of technology that's actually being used because of its potential for harm or how widespread it is actually being used. But um, I think you have to marry, you know, that risk-based approach with something on the regulatory side in order to really tackle third party. I do want to work with that, Anjaka. I do want to get your perspective on this because this is a question of how we assess our risk uh, it is something that came up yesterday as well. And I do want to spend some time on it, probably even get Kush's perspective there. But Ruzbe, you wanted to add to this. Please go ahead. Absolutely. I just wanted to echo on uh, what previous speaker said and Rachel uh, took most of my points. One thing I just want to uh, highlight is that uh, the the mechanisms for keeping track of equipment, hardware and software, uh, where they're being sourced from multiple, uh, sometimes hundreds of different manufacturers, it exists today in aerospace and defense, especially in the Western ecosystem and the NATO ecosystem. Airbus is an example. There are chain of custody mechanisms where you know, the equipment that are, are being brought in, it's almost handled like evidence. So there's tight control and chain of custody uh, mechanisms. So it's being done today. It's a matter of extending it to things that, for example, is being used in utilities. So uh, we, the wheel doesn't have to be invented. Uh, trail doesn't have to be blazed. It's there. It's just a matter of bringing that mechanism into what now we consider to be important yeah, no, fair enough. And, and I, I appreciate those references as well, which I will come back to. Uh, Jack, uh, I'll go to you. And then Usman, will, uh, who's, uh, who's tuning in virtually, Usman, will come to you after we hear from, from Jack. Uh, Jack, please, your perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think these are all really good points. And I think what Rachel is saying around, you know, from a business point of view, it's going to be very difficult for for especially small to medium sized businesses, the lifeblood of, of the Canadian economy to go to the depths, you know, to make sure that they've got those, those things in place. So some sort of, you know, I often talk about security being a team sport, but maybe we need to also start looking at risk management being a team sport and how, how do we support uh, small businesses in that, you know, uh, looking at different tools that are already in place, but also, you know, just, making a lot of this information more broadly available so people can tap into it and not reinvent it for themselves. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Osman, I know that you wanted to, to chime into this conversation. So, Osman, uh, I will turn it over uh, to you. Osman's connection to come back through. Um, 
So I'll, I'll come back to you very shortly once we have you back online. But uh, Octavia, do you want to add uh, something to this? Yeah, I do. Um, Thank you. One of the things that um, is very um, is striking me is that we need we are kind of making a lot of assumptions and not sticking to the facts, True. right? We need to make sure that we're understanding exactly what we know and the information that we know and think on a logical scale, right? So one of the facts that I think Mark mentioned was that it was actually a, you know, within the, something within the supply chain, but it was something that was previously manual, now automated, right? And I think we kind of go back to, yes, if we would have been able to actually do QA, if we would have, as Michael said, being able to actually do those control checks and not necessarily base and, and wait for anyone else to actually do it on our behalf, but we need to make sure that the company is actually doing QA checks when before they put something in production, as Michael said, make sure that we're actually testing the infrastructure that goes in. And my question to Northern Horizon right now would be, did you do it? Did you do those QA checks? And if the system used to be manual, what do what does they need right now to be able to push switch that back to manual so that we can actually start on start recovering quicker? Right. That's where we need to kind of focus and try to see if we can actually go back to the recovery, because that's, those are the facts that we know. We don't know whether the system was the components were built in Canada or Taiwan or anywhere else. But we do know that this one component was misbehaving. And therefore, that one component is where we need to focus. Okay. Kush, if I can get your perspective on this and then perhaps you can hear from Kelly, is the approach that Octavia has suggested uh, keeps us very focused. Do you agree with it? Are there any other things that we might be missing on? Or, or do you agree that we need to focus on this piece right now? Yeah, at this point in time, we have to, you know, I specifically figure out um, how to remediate that one specific circumstance because we know it's, you know, semi-isolated. So from a technical perspective, yes, we have to focus all energy on that. Um, so if we look at uh, there is a discussion about um you know the the supply chain right so if we look up you know upstream where actually everything happens right and then it goes downstream to the technical in government at least um at, at the city of toronto we had implemented a bylaw that mandates um, all procurements to have cyber security requirements so we, we're seeing some, you know, some others follow that, but uh, there's no legislation that requires that. But we need to take proactive steps, one. Um, second, uh, we have to look at uh, risk assessment and actually conducting a risk assessment from a CISO office perspective on the procurement office of your organization. So if, if you conduct that and you look at the policies, you look at how things are moving in procurement, right, then... It, in my experience, you'll see kind of a yellow or a red, and then you can have those discussions. So then you can transfer the risk to the procurement department because for cybersecurity, we need to procure faster. And and third is really doing the risk assessments as, as the other folks mentioned. So having that as a mandatory requirement for any project in your organization is key. And and you would have to have you know specialists that look after that. Now, can you control you know, uh, a zero day. No, you cannot control hardware and software that you are purchasing. You're, you're assuming that it's going to be secure, right? Or at the very least that they're going to find the issues and communicate that through patching, etc., to the customers as soon as possible. Now we know that doesn't happen. So we have very little control on that, on that perspective. So when we get uh, alert, we need to immediately patch, we need to immediately take some action to the extent possible, right? Sometimes you cannot do that, but we have to have some mitigation or compensating controls put in place if you cannot patch. And those need to be documented and then accepted by someone in the business or the leadership, not the CIO and not the CISO. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions that I've seen online as well, but I'll go to Sumon and then to Ruzbe. Sumon, please. An excellent conversation, and I'm really glad to hear risk has come up. The one, uh, there's two pieces that are missing from this conversation. One, we're dealing with critical infrastructure, 
And with critical infrastructure, uh, we need to go back to the basic design principles and the architecture of this. What are the redundancies that has caused the failure? What's the diversity of that supply chain or equipment um, um, with regards to that critical infrastructure? And um, it comes right back down to how do we architect the redundancies and how do we architect the mode? We are living in a very connected world. If that connected world has caused uh, some of this chaos, then we need to really come back to principles of manual, well, what are the elements that we can focus in on uh, to ensure that it can operate standalone. Bruce Bay, you had a comment to make and I'll uh, respond to Sumon as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, on the topic of procurement, um, mm, I'm going to bring it back to the situation that we're in. So if we're in a situation, where, let's assume that the entity that we're speaking about has the right mechanisms for procurement process, testing, um, cybersecurity uh, validations, etc. cetera. Um, if as part of the recovery, we need to bring in new equipment. So let's say physical equipment is damaged, we need to bring in new, new stuff. Uh, Mark uh, uh, used a phrase yesterday where he said, if you're operating in a degraded environment, you're breaking the rules. Um, making sure that as we're bringing new equipment to recover from this, that we are keeping in mind that we may be introducing new threats here, not just from a QA and cybersecurity perspective, but even implementation and, you know, hooking things up, changing, you know, simplest things, changing the default credentials and equipment that we're bringing in. So keep keeping those in mind. Thank you, Ruiz Bay. And I will say this is that the module that we have on restoration, this is something that uh, that I'm looking forward to bringing uh, into that conversation as well. So thank you both, Suman and Ruiz Bay, for, for raising these points and, and Octavia for, for bringing back our focus to what's the issue at hand and how can we bring services back up. Lena, if I can loop you into this, because while we focused a lot on, on the technical realities of what may have happened, how can we mitigate, how can we, we bring services back up, from your lens right now, can you... Tell me what, besides you know, the obvious impact on travel at the start on day one was if subways were shut down in the middle, we had to rescue people from there. If train services had stopped abruptly in the middle of nowhere, we had to now figure out how to bring people back up. Although we do have backup power, we've had some instances of people getting stuck in elevators, but we've also looked at impact on hospitality and travel from an aviation perspective. In your view right now, what are two or three major concerns that we need to be thinking out just from an operational perspective? Uh, thank you for that. That's a great question. I think one of the things we've been focusing on from the impact on travel and hospitality is we're focusing on moving people. What you can't rule out or you can't, you have to factor in is the impact on the supply chain. Because if it's impacting travel and planes and trains and everything else, it's also going to impact our supply chain and our ability to move um, commodities. So what does that look like? How are we doing that? Um, in in If we are having to transition to different ways of travel, because again, if we're talking about gridlock and traffic, how are we getting supplies in and out? So you look at how that the ripple effect is going to be significant on every industry, not just on hospitality or travel because of that. So again, how do we address that? How do we get supplies in? How do we, we still have to move people, you know, you look at the airport and what that looks like from an emergency <clears throat> planning perspective. Now, we, again, we're talking about global impact because if flights aren't getting in and out, it's now backing up flights globally. You have Canadians who may be stranded who aren't able to come home. Uh, you have to factor all that in. What happens to, and I think it was Jack who brought up people who are stuck here who were, let's say, transiting through Pearson or they aren't going to be able to move, you know, things about... And even something as sm which seems so small to us when we're looking at it on such a large scale, but somebody who maybe now is stranded here for two or three days may not have life-saving medication with them. So how do we address that? How do we how do we mitigate those risks? Because people are going to get hurt and and unfortunately die as a result. So those kind of impacts, as well as again the impact of our how do we transition to expedite being able to move? So do we transition to rail? Do we put our efforts there? Um, if we're going to um, ports, how do we help facilitate that? Because they're all going to be impacted as well. The St. Lawrence Seaway is quite a significant trade route. Yep, I want to work with that shortly. Rachel, you had uh, a comment to make, please. Yeah, I think those are all. Uh you know, excellent points. The only, the other question that I would ask here is, um, you know, as far as what we've confirmed at this point, there's something within our supply chain that 
shouldn't be there. And I wonder if that element is also in our, you know, hospitality, travel, tourism supply chain as well, right? So um, we're thinking right now a lot about, you know, impacts onto that sector because of a cyber attack in other sectors. But what if that cyber attack is also prevalent in this sector that we're talking about? And what could that mean for people that are on airplanes or um, on cruise ships or et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and, and how are we verifying and validating that there's no spread um, from that supply chain attack into that sector specifically? Mark, if I can uh, loop you into this conversation, I mean, we have, seen a an increase in maritime related cyber attacks so that like we can, our audience can understand as well and those who are not familiar with this brutal reality is that cyber attacks against transportation industry specifically transit and public transit is this we are aware of i think 2023 in atlanta something had happened is this a growing reality that we have simply been ignoring i think it's a tool for disruption the same as <clears throat> the same as going after any kind of critical infrastructure or grid or any kind of communications networks. And uh, one of the things that uh, Ruzbe said that rang true with me is that in this moment where you're shifting to potentially a degraded mode of operating, you don't want to reduce your standards for for doing things correctly because if you did in in a rush and that's when you would do it, deploy some new communications gear and forget to change the default credentials, for example. That, that is a very common mistake of, you know, going way back, one that I remember is um, Sony and their PlayStation Network. They were under a distributed denial of service attack, but they wanted availability and that was important to them. So they removed some of their security devices and then lost all of their credit card data. Because in that heat of the moment where the most important thing is get things running again, you might do something that you would not do in normal day to day that puts you at an even greater risk. And that might be what your adversary wants. That might be what they're pointing towards. Heather, if I can just uh, bring you back into this conversation as well. One of the things that you had mentioned in day one was we need observability. We need, we need to have some metrics into our assets, et cetera. We're now seeing that our endpoints also could be something that we need to be paying a lot of attention to. From a technical perspective, how would you recommend we isolate certain endpoints at this point just for the risk factor that might be associated with them? What, what is the most seamless way to get this done? Well, I think uh, the underlying assumption here is uh, a major attack that is ongoing. That means there has to be uh, some sort of command and control. This is not a self-operating piece of equipment that does its own thing. This is a very live uh, thing and the threat actor needs to be able to also respond uh, equally in real time <coughs> Sorry, to uh, mitigations or to things that are happening by the team. Even as they try to restore things, there is a desire to recompromise or to do things to basically keep the disruption going as long as possible. Command and control implies network connectivity in some degree. So I think that would be target number one. Uh, look at the attack surface. Look at not just what the assets are, but what is the topology of communication? Uh, that equipment that came in from the supply chain, it came into somewhere. It's sitting in the network architecture somewhere. Uh, isolate based on that. So start with uh, the external facing north-south. See if it stops something and start going layer by layer in and isolate what's there. Uh, with all of these things, again, uh, kind of going back to your comment from the beginning about preparedness, the more prepared you are and the more you have an understanding of that topology and attack surface, the better shape you're in, the faster all of this can happen. Uh, the more you can get in front of the attacker in question here, the less prepared you are. And sadly, a lot of cases, uh, this isn't uh, mapped out as well as it should be. It becomes um, both an exercise in figuring it out on the spot, as well as kind of a little bit of a whack-a-mole uh, of just what's happening there. But I would absolutely target the command and control in this case and try to isolate the incident and start uh, just from there. Thank you. Uh, we have about eight minutes to go. And, and Octavia, I want to loop you back into this conversation. You know, with your knowledge of the financial sector and your knowledge of managing PII and PI, one of the concerns that has emerged is in the hospitality sector, which right now, given all of the different things we have going on in the city, all the different people that are visiting, we a lot of our hotels, a lot of that industry is holding a lot of information and it's now moving manual. What kind of controls do they need to have in place at this point to ensure 
that those individuals, their data is handled carefully and with respect, not just to our regulations, but foreign regulations as well. Yeah, no, that's actually a really good question. One of the things that you want to make sure that individuals are actually on a lookout for is the the uptick in fraud, because most fraud, um, most fraud protections, if the if the connectivity is down, if power is down, those fraud protections are no longer there. Right. And so things that like fraud checks, identity checks, things that normally are actually very, um, very dependent on Internet um, accessibility as well as power, those things won't be available. So we have to make sure that we're actually, you know, have a stash, have, make sure that we're actually having cash somewhere and make sure we have some type of um, availability to access that as well. But I also think that the hospitality um, industry has to make sure that they have some types of locks and controls. Right. It goes back to what what I said earlier, those manual processes that we for so long have now depended on technology and digital to really be our safeguards. Those things are no longer there. So we have to think about what how we used to actually function when we were children. We didn't have you know the Internet. We have to think about locks and we have to think about storing um, information and actually how to move that forward, because even though, you know, when you, know, you go back to COVID, when regulations are lax, those regulations are still put in place. And so accountability is still there for the hospitality committee um, industry. Accountability is still there for financial sector to make sure the data is protected. And so we have to really think about what controls and really need to put in place to make sure that we protect consumers and citizens. Okay. George? Yeah, I have to say, though, it's tough with hospitality because as we saw during COVID, the hospitality industry was absolutely rocked just from the lockdowns, right? You're talking about industries that run on very, very tight margins that oftentimes are weeks, if not a month or two away from always going under. Um, like I, I know in my personal life, I worked in, in the in the nightclub industry, in the, in the bar industry and restaurant industry for 10 years. Uh, and I can tell you that, you know, if we got rocked with a major power outage and we ended up losing a week or two weeks worth of revenue, that's it. The business is over. Um, and a lot of these folks, they, they already live in kind of precarious situations because the margins are so tight. We have to look at, at it as a as a government and as a society, what are we going to do to protect these peoples and these industries, right? Because that's a thing that needs to happen. When, when we emerge from, from COVID, from the lockdowns, a lot of restaurants have gone under. A lot of people who were normally in the service industry had left it. So you had a lot of new people who were looking for work who had no expertise in what they were doing. Like if you guys remember service in like 2021, 2022, real bad service at restaurants, real big lineups, you know, cost overruns. I think it's difficult that we have to now bring the hospitality industry into the conversation about disaster recovery and how to actually support the society because if we finance it and if we give them the resources to actually still function, they can provide us with the food and some of the facilities that actually help people in their communities. They can be a good local resource, but we have to look at it before the situation happens, not after the fact, because they simply cannot survive when something like this happens. Here I have uh, Kelly and then I'll go uh, to Lena. Yeah, I want to sort of stitch together a couple comments that have been made here. I think, George, you, you sort of brought forward the idea around the pre-planning. So we're in the middle of an incident and, and things are more reactive now. But for future, pre-planning around the comment that Kush made that we need to have places for people to congregate places that are safe. So, you know, we could call it a shelter, we could call it a community gathering place, but there are places that are not being used for their normal business right now, including airports that have a lot of space. So, you know, can there be planning to use airports and community centers and, and large restaurants and, and areas that can't function in the way they should, but can function as a safe place for people to go, which would then allow uh, local governments to bring potentially food, water, things, supplies, medicines to these places instead of to people's homes or, or, you know, to people individually, because that's a losing battle to try to take care of everybody in the place that they live. But we can have gathering places as a plan, as opposed to, uh, you know, as a crisis. 
And then the other thing I want to say is around the restoration we've all talked about, let's say we identify the exact part that needs to be replaced with something that's not contaminated. We need to think about who implemented it the first time and not having that person implement it this time, because we actually don't know in this scenario yet that that person wasn't involved, that there's not insider uh, cooperation, let's say, to the attack. And in most companies, the person that knows these types of, let's say, network connections or, or component connections, there's typically the expert and we always go to the expert. So we are potentially putting ourselves at risk having the same person fix the problem that was implemented the first time. They may or may not have been involved, but we need to be careful. No, thank you. Thank you for that, Kelly. And the issue of insider and identity is something that we also have uh, the folks from SailPoint here is something that we will will dive into a lot deeper as well. So thank you for bringing that up. And I've made a note. I know we had uh, Lena Kush and then Ruzbe. Lena, please. Go I ahead. just I just want to touch on something Mark said about in the time of crisis, you're going to rush to try to get things, and some of your um, sort of safeguards may not be at, at the forefront. And I think. There has to be a very fine balance with that because on top of maybe rushing through on the tech side as well is without power or what security measures are you not implementing whether let's say the airport is running on a uh, sort of very very vital threat vital flights only um are you still security screening what security measures are being in place is and it from a uh not a people perspective, but from a commodity perspective, what security and safeguards are being um, sort of put by the wayside in order to expedite some movement of, of anything. And I think we have to be so cautious because so many times uh, criminality or people who want to do something of harm, it's an opportunity. And so if you know that, you know, it's going to take too long to get through security lines and some stuff is going to get bypassed, then it's a heck of an opportunity for people to take advantage of that. So just to be wary that in our rush to get things up and moving, there's certain things that we can't, uh, we can't let go of. A very important point and, and the, the question of physical security yeah. and how these two converge together at this point, uh, something that we've overlooked in some cases. And uh, I appreciate you, you bringing this up because it adds another consideration for all of us. Thank you, Lena, for that. Kush and then Ruzbe. We have to also consider that we cannot get to the bank. We cannot go to the ATM. People are We'll have a little bit of cash because we're in a digital economy. Most most Canadians use Interact or uh, you know credit cards, etc. So, considering that, um, we have to come up with a national plan in Canada where folks will be given free food, free water, free beverages, free shelter, free uh, prescription drugs on the spot based on their health conditions. So. We have to make sure private sector, specifically retail, understands this. And then whatever the bill is, they can give it to the government after. But if you need your di diabetes medication, you go to the pharmacy, you can't pay them. So they, you know, we need to come up with a mechanism in this country. So you go there, you get your medicine. For example, you go somewhere, you get some food. And tourists specifically, tourists uh, have no place to go. They have their luggage. Even some of them won't even be able to get their luggage because it's in the carousel. Okay. So we have to house these folks, right, at no cost. So that whole infrastructure, that whole thinking, um, is something critical, uh, spe especially at day three and beyond. Thank you for that question, and Jack. I do want to get your comments on this. Sort of like this insurance plan and what this what this looks like. Uh, Ruse Bay, please go ahead. Uh, what I'm about to say has a lot to do with what uh, Lena mentioned. Uh, I have a comment and a question. So my comment is very much like Lena said. Like as um, air travel is impacted, um, traffic is being diverted probably to Montreal, to Buffalo, you know, nearby airports, and then there's probably an uptick in land border as well um, crossings. Um, so. I, I think it's prudent for uh, agents like CBSA to have uh, not necessarily by this attacker, but most likely by opportunist attackers who are trying to get things in or get people in. Uh, and my question is actually for Usman, pri primarily around airport security. Um, as airports are going through 
uh, this type of crisis. Um, what are your thoughts on securing sensitive areas of the airports, uh, hangars, uh, fuel supplies, uh, and also uh, uh, physical security where you try to prevent people from infiltrating? Interesting. Uh, an interesting question. And uh, I'm not entirely certain if we've got the audio throughput coming in from, from our virtual folks, but if we do, uh, I'll just look for a cue from our team here. But before I, before I sort of respond to that and bring some responses to it, Jack, I do want to get your take on what Kush has suggested. And that is a process in place where at least the citizens and residents and those with some status from a Canadian perspective Policies and procedures have to be set in place to provide access at no cost. Sounds theoretically very neat, practically and operationally, and, and dare I even say financially feasible? Whew. I mean, that's, I mean, it is a tough question. I mean, is it is it financially feasible? I guess part of it is, you know, we saw this a lot with the pandemic, right? You know, if we were talking about the pandemic in 2019, you know, we would have thought about the cost of that. Um, so there's, I guess there's a couple of things, right? It's what's right as as human beings, uh, both for our fellow citizens as well as those people who are here either visiting by choice or just transit in transit. Um, it's sort of the right thing to do to make sure that they have the basic necessities of life. Um you know, and and hopefully in a modern society in a strong country like Canada, we can, you know, we'll we'll figure out how how that is, that burden is is borne after the fact. Um, you know, but there's also you know we haven't talked about you know, what what are our legal responsibilities to make sure that people have access to these things, right? So I mean I don't know if it's an insurance thing or it's yeah. uh, something it's, it's something else, but you know we all have we have a responsibility you know if we're in a position of authority in order to make sure that people do have those necessities. Thank you for that. Um, if I can see if Usman can be queued up. Usman, there was a question specifically uh, from Ruse Bay to you. If you want to chime in very quickly and I, I will go on mute, please go ahead, Usman. So the question of physical security, uh, one of the comments I had earlier is that by day two, the airport staff should have an idea of uh, what essential services uh, are are, are working, are functioning, have staff, and what aren't needed. One of those essential services will be physical security, which includes the video surveillance, which includes access control. Um, backup power should be prioritized for these systems to ensure that the safety of the passengers in the airport, the staff, and the assets that are in and around the airport. I would imagine that by day two, that physical security would be heightened a little bit more to have an elevated state of, 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 of security where we get help from the security partners at the airports have. Uh, it's critical because if you look in and around the airport, there are a lot of points of entry uh, that can be that can be infiltrated and compromised. You have fuel storage, you have airport hangars, you have uh, supply lines of um, fuel, electricity, and, and and there's so much more going on. So I would imagine at this stage where uh, we are already two days in, we would have um, uh, not just the airport security staff, um, all hands on deck at the security ops center, monitoring all the video feeds, but also the physical security in and out of the airport with the help of local partners, uh, like the Peel Regional Police in the case of Toronto Pearson, uh, or CSIS, or the border, um, the, the CBSA. So all of these uh, agencies would be collaborating, coordinating, again, uh, it's day two, so we're we're beyond the initial um, uh, scramble. So we should be in a place now where we are uh, keeping that as a top priority. One other point I wanted to make earlier, um, I know we were talking about supply chain security, and I just wanted to bring up one reality and one dimension that probably we're not considering with respect to supply chain when it comes to operational technology in critical infrastructure. 
if I was to, I'll give you an example. If I was to buy a piece of hardware, let's say a, a, a PLC or a, or a controller, and I was in buy it off the shelf, the lifespan of that hardware is anywhere from 10 to even 30 years. Like even right now on the field, there will be hardware that is controlling critical processes that is 15, 20 years old. And so when we're dealing with supply chain, we're not just dealing with the fact that the components of that that hardware are assembled in different parts of the world. We're also dealing with the time issue where we may have a piece of equipment that was uh, that has a piece of hardware that is not serviceable that someone designed at some place in time decades ago and uh, and there might not even be replacements for it so i think uh, that that issue of legacy uh, systems is a very prominent prominent one in uh, critical infrastructure and that also we need uh, needs to be taken care of and how do we take care of that we spoke about uh, containment we spoke spoke about uh, network architecture. We also spoke about um, uh, uh, having, securing our supply chain with policies and ensuring that our suppliers adhere to certain standards uh, that, uh, that we've set for them. So uh, going back to that pre-planning discussion, really with respect to uh, securing our uh, infrastructure from supply chain attacks, it's about focusing on the fact foundational elements. Uh, do our procurement processes in our organizations, do we have a, uh, a framework to, incru to include um, certain measures and controls in our, con in our procurement process itself so that, that when we procure um, uh, critical infrastructure assets, we have some of those con controls built in and we offset the liability uh, to the vendor so that they provide us something that is secure by design. With respect to network architecture, that's another foundational measure that organizations need to take, where we design the network in a way that if one uh, part of the infrastructure is compromised, we are able to cordon that off, we're able to contain it, and, we're, and, and, that, that, and containing that should not affect other areas of, of, of the operation. Like, for example, with respect to the, with the, with the airport uh, at Toronto Pearson, we have our network architecture uh, in a way where we have, where if one system goes down, it doesn't affect uh, or has a minimal impact on, on other systems. And if there is a threat that is introduced uh, in one system, it doesn't um, navigate uh, to, to another system and there's controls in place. So um, a lot of the discussion around supply chain security, it needs to factor in the, the, the fundamental nature of operational technolo technology that any large organization with OT will have legacy systems and it needs to have a network architecture that takes uh, that into account in, in its design. Thank you for that, uh, Osman. We have about three minutes. I'm going to go to Octavia and then Michael. <laughs> We'll come to you and then and then we'll come to soft landing. Octavia, please. No, no, thank you. I agree 100% with everything Usman said. One of the things that we probably need to look at, you know, we've been talking about um, Northern Horizon and what they need to do from an OT perspective. Um, and I think we've all said it around the table, but one of the things that we haven't really brought up is every industry or every company should have a recovery checklist. Right. Um, that actually prevents from something being rushed in and, you know, actually being insecure, lacks controls. If we actually had a standard playbook and, a re you know, how do we recover? How do we actually, you know, operate if something were to happen? And I think coming out of this exercise, one of the things that I think we all need to look at is when if there's a situation where there's power outage or when there is a utility um impact uh you know a couple of years ago we had the entire you know uh internet go down um for certain servicers right what do we need to do and what do we need to come up with one of the things that we need to actually look at as well and i think usman touched on it but not really fully is do we have understanding of our assets and how other assets that are diverse right so i think uh nadir talked about having 
something that actually does the exact same thing, right? But in a different way. When they're diverse, do you know where they are? How accessible are they? Can you swap them out quickly? Do you have someone in your data center or um, that can actually access them quickly and, and move? And I think those are the things that we need to kind of look look into to see if we can recover quicker. Thank you for that, and very well correlated to what Nadir had recommended as well. Michael, if very quickly I can bring you into the conversation, a slightly generic question, but from a technical standpoint, one of the items we had discussed uh, as we were preparing and, and considering the impact is, th from a transportation perspective, this impacts not just Ontario where the power is out, but Canada as a whole. And with flights coming in, more devices connecting onto uh, networks within our airports, within our transit, are there any technical steps that you would recommend need to be taken to isolate or maybe not allow certain devices like regular cell phones get connected to our networks at this point while we're trying to contain the lateral movement or potential lateral movement of this attack? Yes, and when you take a look at the infrastructure, especially around the aerospace field, um, the key components that would be really at risk here would typically be the systems you'd see in the end of the airports, for example. I would definitely recommend shutting off Wi-Fi for the particular uh, passengers being able to access this new thing, uh, as well as understanding and identifying um, access points that uh, any particular passenger might have access to. It's very common sometimes to see hotjacks still live in an airport, for example. So that would be another key factor to look at on that side of things. Your typical Windows environments, Unix, Linux, Linux environments that support get uh, critical infrastructures in the airports would definitely be a target. Your, your typical legacy type of systems, you know, such as your OS 390s, AS 400s, uh, SCO and uh, HP UX type of systems would still be vulnerable, but they're typically not going to be targeted in these type of a secondary type of attacks. Or we'll leverage, not even nefariously, just the mere fact that somebody might have access to it and it might be functioning and they need it to, you know, maybe message somebody uh, at home, let them know, hey, I'm still working at the airport, I'm in a lockdown type of thing. Uh, so, you know, just focus on those type of systems would be critical. Thank you very much uh, for that, Michael. Um, I do know that we are at the top of the hour, so I'm going to just ask Mark to uh, summarize at least three very important takeaways, and then we'll move into the next module. Mark. Well, thanks, Ellie. This, uh, this conversation touched on a lot of different spots, and you know, it, it keeps surprising me that uh, the majority of the things we're solving have are, are not really related to the root cause because the knock-on effects of not having a, a plan for many of these uh, well, the outcome of this unlikely or at least historically unlikely event, um, people aren't ready for it. And so one of the things we touched on was making sure we don't take shortcuts in restoration or response just because it's an emergency, because that could actually make things quite a bit worse. Um, it was also mentioned that maybe we wouldn't be here if we put more effort into our QA process and vetting before we install something new or before we try to change something over. Um, that again, that prep work is completely worth it. I know that timelines are tight and projects need to get done quickly, but that extra QA effort to test the assumptions can sometimes save you from this. And I've seen that happen. And the last thing we talked about a little bit was not making this an, an IT or an OT leader decision, right? The acceptance of the risk, because it's true. Um, I think Usman was the one that talked about the devices that are there from you know, 10, 20 years ago. A simple example would be in Ontario, we have smart meters. They're, they're essentially computers on every house. And they are, some of them, going to be 15 years old now. And so the tech that's in them is that old and may be uh, inaccessible or unpatchable. It might have vulnerabilities. And we can accept that. We can say, that's fine. Here's what we've done to make that tolerable. But the person in charge of the business, the leader with, at the appropriate level to accept that scale of risk needs not just to accept it, but to fully understand what they're accepting. And so to take the time to explain it to them and take the time so that they can make the informed decision rather than saying, oh, IT's got that. Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for that. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. There's, uh, there's quite a lot that we've looked at in this session, but more importantly, the reality of operationalizing some of these items beforehand, the financial costs that come with it, the resources, and really the impact that we're seeing in real time, that economic impact number will continue to grow and uh, much, much beyond the 
the isolation of this breach and the recovery as well. I thank you all for joining us. We will be taking a short break. We'll then have a tool utilization video from the team at Armis, and then we'll jump into our next module around cross-border impact. Thank you for joining us and I'll see you very shortly.